A uh, very warm welcome to all of you. Um, welcome everyone to City Lights Live. This is how we do live these days. This is the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of uh, City Lights Bookstore's in-store calendar during the shelter in place. Uh, as many of you know, though, we are unable to hold events at, at our bookstore, which we've long tradition of holding the events up in the poetry room. We are still continuing through the Zoom world to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with uh, these online readings, discussions, and forums throughout the month of August and into the fall. So I'm, uh, I'm broadcasting live to you in uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti's office. So it's uh, some, giving you all some City Lights flavor here uh, until you can get back to visit us. Um, just wanted to say very quickly before we get started with the reading that um, for those of you that don't know, City Lights of uh, the bookstore has finally reopened its stores to the public. We're following uh, very, very strict pandemical guidelines. Um, masks are required. There's a hand sanitizer everywhere. So if you haven't come back to visit us, please do. The bookstore misses you. We miss you. Bookstore is good therapy. So uh, come by and see us. Come visit the bookstore. We're open 12 days, seven days a week. So um, yeah, I look forward to seeing you all. And uh, like I said, the bookstore misses you as well. So. Come on in and say hello. Um, yeah, we're, um, uh, and you know, we are a bookstore, like I keep saying, but we're also a publishing house for these, those of you that don't know, for those of you who's, who's had this little fact slipped, City Lights is a long tradition of publishing amazing poetry and revolutionary literature. Um, this year, we're actually very proud, very, very proud. We're celebrating 10 year anniversary of the great Spotlight Poetry Series. And, uh, these are two new books released in the uh, Pocket Poet series that we're uh, very, very proud of. New books by Sophia Dalin and uh, Uchi Nuduka. So uh, yeah, this is a Spotlight Poetry series as well. Over, over the Luna, excited to be featuring U.S. Poet Laureate of One Time, Juan Felipe Pereira's new book as well. This just came out a few days ago and it's a genuine milagro. So come on and get, come on and get yourselves a copy of a Every day we get more illegal by Juan Felipe Pereira. So, um, and in the future, please keep your eyes out for the new books by Seshu Foster and Pamela Snead that we're very excited about. I could go on and on, but I won't. I'm just going to say to learn more, go to www.citylights.com. And you can also visit us on media, social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. So tonight, tonight's event, oh man. Let me just say City Lights is over La Luna, excited <laughs> to be welcoming Hector Tobar and his very special guest, Oscar Vidalon. Tonight, they're going to be discussing Hector's amazing new libro, The Glass Great Road Bomb. Yeah, <laughs> y'all give, 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 uh, give Hector some jazz hands or some claps or something there. Whatever you do in this little square there, show him some love. We're going to be having an, uh, uh, it's going to be a great discussion between Hector and Oscar. And then at the end, we're going to be having a Q&A for y'all. So uh, if you have any questions for Hector or Oscar, por favor, post your question in the chat comment. And at the end, we'll read them out uh, and, uh, and they'll answer. So uh, that should be a really wonderful way to uh, end the evening. And I also just want to say very briefly, por favorcito, remember we're a bookstore. So I want to encourage everyone to buy books, buy Hector's new book. If you can, if you haven't already, uh, there's going to be uh, links to being able to buy the book in the comments question. So go ahead and do that if you can, if you're able, if you want to. So without further ado, let me let me introduce tonight's very, very special guests, y'all, in conversation tonight. Give it up for Hector Tobar and Oscar Villalon. Thank you, Josep. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for, for tuning in. Uh, normally I would say thank you for coming out to the store, um, but thank you for being here uh, tonight. Um, it is my uh, privilege to talk to Hector Tobar about uh, his new novel. Um, before I begin, let me just introduce myself really briefly. I'm Oscar Villalone. I'm the managing editor of Ziziva, uh, San Francisco Literary Journal. We're celebrating our 35th anniversary uh, this year. And a little bit about, uh, about Hector. Um, he is the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and novelist. He's the author of the critically acclaimed New York Times bestseller, Deep Down Dark, as well as the Barbarian Nurseries, Translation Nation, and The Tattooed Soldier. He's a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, an associate professor at the University of California at Irvine. 
Uh, he has written for the Los Angeles Times, the New Yorker, and other publications. And his short fiction has appeared in the best American short stories, L.A. Noir, Ziziva, and Slate, the son of Guatemalan immigrants. He's a native of Los Angeles where he lives with his family, although tonight he is joining us from Oregon. How do you do, Hector? Well, thank you, Oscar. I am fine. Thanks so much for agreeing to do this and greetings from Springfield, Oregon. I'm on the road, which seems appropriate since I wrote a road novel and this is a road novel. The sounds you hear, if you have a really sound, if you're listening to this on headphones and you hear the sounds of a road in the background, that's not a sound effect. That is an actual road. <laughs> I'm a few blocks down here from Springfield, from downtown Springfield, where there's a beautiful mural to Ken Kesey. But um, I'm just really honored to be here at City Lights, um, such a legendary bookstore. Uh, when I was a young man in my 20s, I was the editor of a community newspaper in San Francisco, and I used to wander up to City Lights at least once a week, and I got a big chunk of my literary education in those stacks uh, in that bookstore. And I just want to thank City Lights for organizing this and for having me and you, Oscar, for agreeing to do this. Oh, no, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, uh, Hector, uh, I think before we begin, um, how about you read uh, an excerpt from the novel? Okay. And then after you do, the, I think the, the set, sort of set the table for us, and then we can uh, launch into our conversation. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm going to read two passages that are very short. Um, um, the first one is the opening paragraph of the novel, and uh, I just want to tell a little bit of the backstory behind this. Of course, this, this, this novel is the story of a real person, Joe Sanderson, who first became known to me as one of the few Americans who died actually in combat fighting in the revolution and civil war in El Salvador uh, in 1982. And so this novel really is about his real life journeys. But as part of my research to, to write this novel, I interviewed Joe's father, Milt Sanderson, when he was 100 years old, I traveled to, uh, to Pennsylvania where he was then living, retired, and I talked to him about Joe's childhood um, because I wanted to write about the complete person. I didn't want to just write about the adventure. I wanted to know who Joe was. And Milt told me so many wonderful stories about his late son's childhood. It, it was uh, obviously a really uh, important um, time for, for Milt to be able to tell me, a stranger, stories about his son uh, who, who died um, at the age of 39. And so one of the stories that Milt told me is that Joe collected butterflies. And, that, uh, and he did this uh, sort of emulating his father because his father, Milt Sanderson, uh, was um, one of the world's leading entomologists. He was a, an expert in, in beetles and also collected butterflies and, and many other uh, insects during the course of his career. And so Joe, em, em, you know, Joe emulated his father. And um, one of the things that Milt told me was that Joe's butterflies that he collected were actually stored in the Natural History Survey of the state of Illinois. And so I looked up their catalog and I found the butterflies that Joe collected. And so if you read the opening of the novel, that's, that's based on a, on a, on a true story, uh, fictionalized by me, imagined by me. So I'll just read the very first paragraph of that, of the opening. Between the sway of wind catching willows, Joe Sanderson searched. He climbed over the knotty skeletons of old shrubs and planted his feet into spongy soil. His sneakers snapped dead branches in two. These were the early days of autumn and his arms and cheeks were still summer bronzed and freckled over the last layers of his baby fat. He was 11 years old and an expert butterfly collector, probably the top kid lepidopterist in Champaign County in his own humble opinion. At night, his bones ached and added marrow, and each morning his limbs felt more sinewy and masculine, as if he'd somehow entered the body of Davy Crockett or Daniel Boone. Manhood was calling to him in the contracting muscles of his calves and his bulkier biceps, but not yet in his loins. For the moment, he was still a boy. So that's the opening paragraph uh, to, to my novel. And also, I have to say that draws on my own experience as a father, because when you're a father of kids, uh, you see there are days when you, they look, you know, they're still growing and then they stop growing. And so a lot of that passage uh, is derived from, um, from, from my own memories of being a, a father and seeing my kids grow up. So as the novel goes forward, Joe um, begins to travel uh, from uh, leaving Urbana, going to uh, on, a, on a canoe trip on the Sangamon River, for example, in, in Illinois, things that he really did. Uh, his, one of his best friends, Jim Adams, 
uh, told me the story of, of Joe going down the Sangamon. And so, um, but then he travels the world and he always is trying to write books. He's trying to write novels. Joe's mission is to be a novelist. Uh, he thinks that the way you do it is you go around the world having adventures, which is what Hemingway did, uh, which is what many of his heroes did. And so he eventually goes to El Salvador after many failed attempts to write novels and ends up becoming a member of a guerrilla army. He, he talks his way into a guerrilla army, which itself is, is pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, and so in this passage, um, this passage is based on uh, a couple of lines that I read uh, in a profile that was done of Joe not long after he died in Mother Jones magazine. Uh, these Mother Jones reporters mentioned that Joe had been present um, just, just, just as the massacre at El Mosote, one of the most famous um, massacres of the Salvadoran Civil War, in which the army uh, killed uh, almost a th thousand people in several villages. Joe was present as the villages were trying to evacuate, as they were trying to get away from these massacres. And so um, I wrote this piece. Um, it, this is Joe leading a group of refugees away from the war zone. And so now in that opening passage, he was 11. In this passage, he's about 38, 39 years old. Um, senora, senora, más rápido, por favor. Or should it be senorita, since she's so young? But that would be sort of an insult, too, because speed it up, young lady. Yeah, I know you're carrying a load there. Here, you, hey, you, help her, help her. Let me help you help her. Take her by the arm, and I'll take the other up and over this mossy rock. I see, I see. If she falls, she might have the baby right here. Freckled-faced mother-to-be, icy river water at her thin ankles, holding my wrist with her arms barely 20, I'd guess. We guide her spidery form over the stream, a big belly at the center of her stringy limbs, and me and her and this boy at the center of a line of 2,000 people stretched out over this canyon, climbing down one side and up the other. The Comandancia and the assorted rebel columns up ahead, the civilians here in the middle with the code-breaking kids from the school to help, and me, a bumbling rebel named Lucas, because that's Joe's nom de guerre is Lucas. Behind us, the radio station crew burdened down with all their equipment, including the precious transmitter, the rebel transmitter with its subversive transistors and diodes and dials. Very dangerous spot here, this river. Lucas and the pregnant girl reached the other side and they stopped while the girl caught her breath and Joe looked up to scan the high ground around them, and he worried the radio, and pe the radio people might get ambushed here. And he yelled out, rapido, rapido, todos rapido. He watched the children from the school bus bound across the rocks, unafraid at play. And then one boy stopped suddenly and looked up at the sky, and the entire line of crossing children paused too and turned their eyes upward as if they were obeying a command the first boy had transmitted via telepathy. Look! Before he saw the helicopters, Joe heard the cardiac beat of their engines. Death up there, up there above us. And Lucas took two steps back into the stream to order everyone out. The helicopters disappeared to the north. They were high up and in a hurry, headed northward, nothing to fear. So those are a couple of passages from my novel, The Last Great Road Bum. Well, thank you, Hector. Um... Before I ask you my first question, if you'll indulge me, I just want to share my thoughts about the book. I think, um, I think you've written an entertaining, playful, you know, haunting and disturbing Bill Dung's Roman, mm. um, a true one. There's the dichotomy of beauty and exaltation with violence and calamity in the novel, um, as people can, can uh, guess from, from what you've read. Uh, the book in the book we're going to travel far, not just in terms of physical geography, but also in terms of spiritual and intellectual territories. Uh, starting in his, as an innocent, Joe Sanderson will become our Virgil, leading mm. us through the various circles of hell, right? That are the war zones and killing grounds of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And on the level of craft, the book is both delightfully self-aware of its limits in terms of what it means to tell, tell somebody else's life story. Right. But also, I think, winningly demonstrates the possibilities that literature affords us in telling the stories of others, of indeed one person in the relationship to the globe. Mm. Uh, there's so much to unpack there. But uh, before we do, 
this is, a, I wanted to get to my, my first question to you, which is this. I read Sanderson's story as one of America. Perhaps mm. we could even say white America. Emerging mm. out of its innocence and privilege. Uh, Absolutely. And early on, Joe barely picks up on the grave injustice and suffering of the places he travels to, mm -hmm. as if he embodies his fellow Americans in terms of their ignorance of empire's toll. And he travels as if the world was laid out for his delectation, right? Exactly, yes. Uh, but this all changes. And it changes well before he travels to El Salvador. Mm -hmm. now, could you talk a little bit about the road bombing that Joe Sanderson does mm -hmm. before he joins the Compass in El Salvador? Yeah, you know, he um, he was addicted to the road. I mean, he just really was good at it. He was good at traveling on the cheap, good at charming his way into free rooms and free meals. And I think at first he really um, he really got a sense of purpose out of just moving and being the hero. You know, uh, you go, you're the young American. It's the 1960s. Uh, you're a very handsome man. Women are attracted to you. Uh, everywhere he goes, he's a hero. Whereas back home in Champaign-Urbana in this college town, he's just another townie and one who dropped out of college, right? He's destined to a life as, 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 as a townie whose life is going to be unremarkable and he's very ordinary back home. But on the road, he's a hero. And so I think at first he, his, his travels were, were very much uh, in the spirit of play and adventure. Um, and then, you know, he becomes very politicized. I mean, this is a guy who, um, when he left home, uh, and his first trips was a was a Republican, uh, you know, supported Nixon against yeah. Kennedy in the 1960 election, and who later um, becomes increasingly uh, radicalized, and and not in a sort of like leftist kind of way, but just really in a you know morally outraged kind of way. His letters become increasingly angry. Um, he goes to Vietnam, you know, during the war as a tourist, and he sees um, he sees prisoners of war executed. Um, he sees the aftermath of, excuse me, of a battle in which prisoners of wars were executed. And um, he goes uh, to, you know, I mentioned it very briefly, he's in Indonesia just a few years after the great massacre of 1965. And he mentions how there are, there are um, villages that have no school teachers because the school teachers have all been killed, right, in 1965. So he's really, you know, in introduced to all these horrors and finally, uh, you know, uh, the, one of the climaxes in the middle of the novel is that he ends up in Biafra uh, in this um, breakaway region of Nigeria during the Civil War. And he wants to get in uh, just, you know, to have his Norton usual adventures, but the Nigerian government won't let him in. They can, you know, they're, they're very wary of, of admitting mercenaries. Some people think yeah. that he's a mercenary, right? Uh, but he gets in working for the Red Cross. And so he has this job in which he's essentially... Um, ministering to people who are dying of starvation, you know, trying, trying desperately to save their lives. And I felt just in the, in, the, in the many years that I spent reading Joe's letters, I too felt that transformation. I just felt this growing awareness of, uh, of, of, of the United States as this power that had, um, that had tried to shape the globe and, and was leaving a, a lot of suffering um, and a lot of violence in its wake. Let's talk about those letters too struck me. He writes these blind letters home to his mother, to his father, his stepfather even, and, yes. uh, and his brother. And he keeps, you know, in, in these letters, he never wants them to know how truly vulnerable and frightened he is as he's traveling the world. And particularly, he doesn't really want them to know how upset he is by all the injustice he's witnessing. And to me, it seems like there's, there's some sort of metaphor there. It's like a, a parallel to a citizenry with its government, uh, with its entertainments, and uh, you know, what's, what's, what we're being shielded from. Yeah, those letters, there's a very interesting dynamic going on with Joe Sanderson's letters. Um, you know, and I quoted the letters verbatim in the novel. I mean, all those, all those quotes are, except for, correct, as I say in the, in the, in the uh, premise, excuse me, in the uh, preface, that um, I corrected some spellings and whatnot, and grammar, right. and, grammar and, and whatnot. But you know, in those letters, um, there's so many different emotional and factual things going on in those letters. I mean, first of all, he's writing to his mother. I was stunned that even when he was in his early 20s, he's telling his mother that he's staying with Rastafarians and smoking ganja. <laughs> you know, that to me really blew me away. First of all, it speaks to how close these two people were. You know, how close Joe was to his mother, how much she loved him and how much they loved each other. 
that Joe could trust her with that, those kinds of facts, you know, because he's also asking her to send money, right, uh, to, to keep his travels going. Um, you know, and, and so then later, I, you know, it took me a long time to realize that he was really trying, he was trying to also impress his mother and father and his brother. He's trying to say, look, I'm doing something that's worthwhile because mm. Steve is going off and hey, he's having a career. Steve is going to become a, a very successful administrator at the University of Illinois. All of his friends are going off and having these careers. His former next door neighbor, Roger Ebert, becomes Roger Ebert, right? Because <laughs> Roger Ebert lived two doors down. And, um, and so Joe is trying to impress people that things are happening, that he's doing things that are worthwhile, that are daring, that are, um, that are in their own way memorable and important. And then finally, he's also trying to protect his mother from worry. And I really, really, you know, that really came home to me in the first letters that I had from him home from El Salvador, where he is um, obviously, he's seen a massacre and he talks about it so lightly. And I almost got angry at Joe. And I have, you know, I think I'm the, I'm, I'm very, very, I was very, I learned to be very tolerant with Joe and yeah. very understanding. But I, ha I had to, and then, and then it occurred to me, of course, he doesn't want his mother to think that he's, uh, you know, that he's facing death all the time, even though he has kind of described a situation, right, where there are bullets flying in his direction. So there's a lot, it's a very, very strange um, and, and, and to me compelling relationship right between these two people the, the letter writer and the and the letter receiver and we're talking about dozens and dozens of letters sent over the course of how many years sent over the course of 20 years 20 and years then, yes and then you're also working with manuscripts of novels that he's either finished or hasn't finished exactly you're also working with um, diaries all in all hundreds of thousands of words Yes, absolutely. Hundreds of thousands of words. And I have to say that I read probably uh, maybe 25 to 30 percent of everything. Um, you know, the, the, the novels um, were problematic. You know, they're, they're difficult to read. Um, and I have to say also, all of this is preserved by, by Joe's brother, Steve. Um, and, you know, and Steve has this, you know, deep, deep and abiding love for his brother. Um, and, and, and did Joe the favor of preserving all of this? Um, even though um, I think a lot of people would have thought, you know, what are you saving all these things for? And, and, mm. and Steve saved them. Um, so yeah, it was, it was an incredible amount of, of stuff to process. And, um, but also just so many gems. I mean, when I read the first group of letters that described Joe's two trips basically around the world in the 1960s, mm. I thought, oh my God, people could write PhD theses, you know, <laughs> uh, dissertations on, on, on these letters. I mean, they're just so rich. Uh, in, in, in his observations, they say a lot about what it meant to be an American, a middle-class white American in the 1960s, uh, living in the world, uh, going about the world. Um, I also had letters from, uh, that he wrote to his girlfriend, you know, uh, one of his girlfriends, who, who just did me the favor of giving me all of the letters he ever wrote to her, which was a wonderful cache of, of just of moments and images. So it was, it was, it, I became addicted myself to the letters in the same way that Joe became addicted to the road. I became addicted to reading the letters and to going through the novel as a letter. And then finally I got to the diary. And I have to say the diary was that he had kept in the war in El Salvador. That was the first thing that I saw. That was the first thing that I knew of Joe um, because, you know, my, my research in El Salvador when I was a LA times bureau chief in Mexico and Central America told me about the diaries. Uh, I started reading the diaries. And I read a good chunk of them and wrote a piece for the LA Times about them. And then I set them aside when I started this book project. And then I got to the diary, that 370 page or so diary that he kept that was on his back when he died. Mm. That diary, um, I read it at the end of my, of my process. I, I read it when I got to the chapters in El Salvador. And I was able to understand it because I had spent you know, six or seven years reading his letters because it's, it was a very personal document to him. It was basically, he was writing to himself, which I think is why the writing is so clear in those diaries and in the letters he was writing to his mother. When he wrote novels, he was writing to some imaginary literary person and his, his, his novels were terrible, but his letters and his diary were just so full of life and so full of details. And I was able to sort of decode a lot of the references in this diary because I had spent, you know, I had been reading 20 years of his letters before that. Given your training as a journalist, 
um, and given the fact you, you, you certainly have written wonderful nonfiction before, um, uh, what point did you think that this story had to be told as a novel? You know, I had written a couple of nonfiction book proposals not long after I wrote my story for the LA Times in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote, I thought, oh, this is a nonfiction book. There's a lot, you know, I'll, I'll research this. And the nonfiction uh, proposals just didn't really jump off the page. They didn't really feel, he didn't feel like a real person. He felt like he was two dimensional. Mm. And, um, you know, and I had just, I had written two books before that. I've written actually two books while um, I was researching Joe's life. Because first I wrote the Barbarian Nurseries. I was finishing the Barbarian Nurseries when I discovered Joe's diary. Um, and then I wrote this uh, book, Deep Down Dark. And, um, you know, I, I thought I could write this as a nonfiction book, but I really wanted to write a novel. And then I thought, then I looked at Joe's life and what he was trying to do. Joe was trying to write novels. He loved the novel as, as, um, as, as a work of art. Um, he studied the novel. He read voraciously, right? Starting with Hemingway and then to James Jones, um, you know, just, just kept on uh, reading uh, D.H. Lawrence throughout his whole life. Uh, just reading voraciously. He loved the novel. And I thought, wow, he was trying to write a novel. I'm a novelist. Maybe I should write a novel about a guy trying to write a novel by leading his life as a character in a novel, right? And, that's, and, it, and then it just sort of seemed to take off. Um, it really, really took off. I just really enjoyed becoming Joe, becoming the boy from the middle of the 20th century, an experience that I have, you know, some ex uh, that I know a little bit about. And then becoming the chronicler, the observer, the witness, which is a lot of what Joe does in his travels. Yeah, you, you know, I was, I was really um, delighted by the idea of how you include Joe in his own story. Yes. And, uh, you know, it, so I was, I, I was wondering if once you thought I need to have footnotes of Joe, that, <laughs> that must have sealed the deal. This could only be told as a novel. That's to say... Um, you know, what gets left out from telling a story like this as creative nonfiction? Oh, you know, there, there is so much that's left out. What's left out is, is the complexity of him as a character. You know, what's left out are his, is, are his desires and wants, the lyricism in his head that he was searching for. You know, Joe understood that, that novels worked because they were beautiful. And so Joe was, in, you know, my imaginary Joe uh, is, is someone who's, who's hunting for, for beauty and, um, and mean, meaningfulness uh, in his life so that he could write novels from it, you know? So his practice as a, as a, as a traveler was as, as one novelist. He would, he would put himself in situations where he could observe life as no one else from his hometown would see it, right? As no other American would see it. And, you know, and also, also what writing a novel allows me to do is to, is to examine things that he never quite figured out, <laughs> you know, Joe never quite figured out women, mm. okay. never quite figured out how women see the world. He was someone who um, was not unlike me, you know, I grew up when I went to college, the women's movement was in full swing. Women were getting, feminists were getting tenure, right? When I went to college, the first, the first group of 1960s radical feminists were getting tenure and they shaped the way I see the world, right? And so Joe, Joe's fiction is pre-women's movement fiction <laughs> and it's very macho. And so uh, writing a novel allows me, writing as a novel allows me to, to sort of unpack that, you know, uh, and to see the, and, and to tell, and to sort of be the perspective of the person of color, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I enjoyed so much um, writing uh, this Rastafarian camp and Joe wanders into the Rastafarian camp and he falls asleep. And the, and the people in this camp, the Jamaican residents of this camp, you know, who are, uh, you know, working people, not rich people living in a camp right outside of Kingston, they, they can regard him for a moment as the son of the empire, right? As, as this, you know, milk fed uh, young man. And uh, there are lots of moments like that in the novel where the road sort of turns back and, and looks at Joe. And that's something that I think only a novel really would allow me to do. Is that also something that is, was more likely to happen when you have a Hector Tobar 
writing the life story of, of a Joe Sanderson? Well, yeah, you know, I'm Centro Americano. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Latino Americano. I've, uh, a, a big chunk of my consciousness has been shaped by, uh, by my um, emotional and family links to Central America and also by my intellectual shaping by the Central American revolutions and, and, and the Central American authoritarian governments, right? Mm. Um, so, so that has, you know, from my first novel, The Tattooed Soldier, to this one, um, you know, they, they are shaped by being a Centro Americano and being able to, um, to tell this story also from a Central American perspective. You know, I went to El Salvador, I interviewed, all, I also interviewed all these former guerrillas, uh, including most importantly, Santiago, who was the head of the rebel radio station. And they told me their perspective on Joe and their encounters with Joe. And they describe them in a way that I'm sure, um, you know, Joe, it's not exactly the way Joe would have described them. Uh, these encounters with him, these debates, right, over the United States. Um, and so, you know, this is also a Central American novel. Um, I hope all the Centro Americanos will, you know, uh, will, will endure the first half of the novel because this, and that's part of what the footnotes are doing, you know, the footnotes are saying, hey, everybody, there's a war coming later that's a Central American war and hang on, you know, because that's, that's coming in the second half of the book. Um, because that for me was also part of the joy of it was, was, was as, a, um, as a sympathizer, as a Centro Americano, creating this revolution, right, as a, as a lived experience and, and just the enormous variety of people involved in it, you know, and so many, and Joe was such a great observer of that. Mm. My favorite moment is he observes a guy who's carrying a Belgian a fall, you know, yes. uh, you know, machine gun, this little kid, I mean, this teenager, but he also has a, a pouch for his slingshot, you know, <laughs> and his mother, his mother made him a pouch to carry a slingshot. So he's got, he's got a, a machine gun and a slingshot. And I mean, who could have made that up? And Joe Sanderson, uh, you know, in a rebel camp, wrote that down in his diary. And now that's in, in, in my novel or our novel, if you want to think of it that way. Well, you know, Hector, if I may say so, I think, I think this novel fits really well with what I perceive to be the sort of project of all your work, oh, which, is, you. which is that the, history, the histories of Americas and the US are intertwined. Um, that you know, we're too often ignorant of how our country has shaped the destinies of millions south of the border and how those people in turn have shaped our society. And I think in this case with this book, I think you're showing us how much a part of each other we are. That someone yeah. like you can tell the story of, of this blonde haired, blue eyed, uh, 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 Midwestern white guy from a 50s uh, 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 Midwest. Yeah, that's, that was always to me the draw of the novel, was that, um, that I would be telling a story of El Salvador and Latin America that would reach into the home of a Midwestern family. And part of the joy of me, a joy of the novel for me, was, was learning about the Midwest and becoming a Midwesterner for the time that I was writing this novel and seeing the world the way as a Midwesterner does, part through going to the Midwest, part through reading Joe's letters, part through the very close relationship I developed with Joe's family, uh, you know, with his father Milton, with Steve and Jenny, uh, Steve's wife, um, just becoming very, very close with them and sort of see, and, 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 you know, being invited into that world that also informed the novel. And then of course, the whole basis of it is that we're all Americans, you know, the United States is this crazy project that actually brings in uh, you know, uh, a son of an immigrant into its fold and educates him. You know, I was educated at the University of California. I was educated in uh, Latin American history. And I was then educated in American United States literature, you know. Um, so, so, so United States literature and Latin American history uh, come together in this story and in my career. And thank you so much for saying that. The last third of the book, um, we find... Joe in, in, in El Salvador, and this is going to be the crucible. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit, what is early 80s El Salvador like? What is, what is Joe literally walking into? Because he comes in over the border from Honduras. Right, he's entering into this incredibly violent event, you know, incredibly violent, even from the first days that he's there in San Salvador as a tourist. He sees a demonstration, an anti-government demonstration that ends with uh, army snipers opening fire on the crowd 
where there are also young men who are secretly armed with weapons precisely because they've anticipated that the, the, the demonstration might come under fire. He, he sees um, bodies in, the, in one of the you know, public spaces of San Salvador in his first days. So we're talking about one of the most vicious and brutal uh, episodes uh, in the history of the Western Hemisphere, right? Ending with the massacre at, in the book, with the massacre at El Mosote, right? Uh, which is this horrific event in which several villages are wiped out by a U.S. trained counterinsurgency right. battalion. And Joe was there in the days after. I interviewed Santiago, the, the former rebel radio leader who was with Joe uh, when they reached El Mosote. And so we're talking about an incredible level of carnage and violence, you know, um, that, and also, you know, you know violent, a very personal level. We're talking about violence against women. And yeah. one of my favorite, one of the, my, the lines in the novel I'm most proud of is when I say that the revolution in El Salvador is among other things, uh, a revolution to defend the bodies of women, right? Because there are so many women comandantes, so many women fighters, and there are women with stories of violation, right, in the, in, in the rebel ranks who've survived violation by government soldiers or, or death squads or whatnot, right? So there's that, but there's also this incredible idealism, this is really romantic uh, moment, because this, the revolution is essentially a, teenagers, people in their 20s, you know, if you're 30, you're old in the revolution, and they're all very young some of them are kind of hormonal and they're falling in love with each other and they're writing poetry to each other. Um, and it's just really this hyper idealistic event, um, which, you know, is, is, was beautiful. And Joe in his, in his notes captured that beauty. And I was so grateful to him for that. He captured the idealism of it. He was, he was very much wrapped up in the idealism of, of, the, of the revolution, of it as this, as this noble event at the same time that he himself participated in, in the violence of it. You know, he, he himself becomes brutalized by it. You can see it in the diary, you can see it in the novel, that he gradually becomes desensitized to the violence around him. He, he comes to uh, accept the fact that the army has to be, the rebel army has to be hard. They have to become hard people. They have to become themselves killers. And um, so, yeah, it's an it's an amazing uh, an amazing part. That, you know that that half of the book that deals with the Salvadoran Revolution is uh, is something that I'm very proud of. He, um, I don't think it's perhaps a coincidence that he dies not too soon after he loses that joie de vie, mm -hmm. that that sort of sense of 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 of, of joy, yes, uh, or basically of. of of being engaged in the world. There's, there's a line uh, in, that, in that part of the book that really just stuck with me. It's when, uh, when the compas, Danny boy, mm. is talking to Joe and he says to him, I'm afraid killing might become part of who we are permanently, like a poison in the soil. And he goes on to say, we all want to think that the final victory will be like a huge pill of happiness, but after all this death, it's hard to imagine peace could follow, as if the fighting may be necessary, but Joe and some of his fellow revolutionaries aren't kidding themselves about the price it exacts. Absolutely, you know, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm very, um, I, I was very proud of moments where I was able to sort of foreshadow Salvadoran history, right? Because that is a foreshadowing of Salvadoran history, but it's also something very, very much um, some, that, that someone could have said in, 19, in 1982, because El Salvador has this, you know, this, um, this horrible massacre that took place in 1932, right? Uh, in which La a good Matanza. chunk, the, the, La Matanza, in which a good chunk of the indigenous population of El Salvador was murdered. Um, and also there are, other, there are other moments in the novel that foreshadow um, the Salvadoran diaspora, right? Um, where we have people who later migrate to El Salvador looking back, or families that have someone migrate to El Salvador looking back at the revolution and what it meant and reflecting on, you know, what's happened to the Salvadoran people, which is beautiful things and, and also things that are very troubling, you know? So, um, so yeah, that's the, I'm, I'm, you know, I was very, um, I was very conscious of trying to reflect um, the modern day reality. And I think that that's just part of also one of the reasons why, uh, you know, uh, the war is such a horrible thing because war leaves these traumas that you know ripple out into a society in so many different ways 
Um, that's definitely true of American society and the wars that we've sent our young men and young women to fight. The, the violence of those wars comes back and ripples across our society. And, and even more so in a country like El Salvador, where that war is fought, you know, in its cities and towns and universities even, you know, um, there's right. a scene where a battle takes place in a university. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I want to say that somehow, you know, we know what's going to happen, uh, how things will end for Joe. And we go on this incredible journey with him, you know, to find himself a man, almost suddenly 40. He was a kid, literally a kid yes. when we meet him. And now he's, he's about to turn 40, uh, winningly, I think, or endearingly complaining about his aches and pains. As yes. one, it's so easy to now being middle-aged to identify with that. <laughs> what it must be like to have to keep up with uh, revolutionaries half your age. Right. Um, you know, realizing, man, maybe I shouldn't have been smoking so much all these years. And right. things along those lines. But as much as, that, as much as you would think this book would, would end on a down note, it, I think it becomes a sort of a testament, I think, to the beauty of writing itself. I mean, to the need to document and otherwise make sense of our brief time on this planet and how, you know, uh, and how even those attempts can inspire, inspire other people to do the same. What, what can you tell us about uh, Joe Sanderson, his appreciation of what the written word can afford us, even while we're being awed and crushed by this world. Yeah, I think that's why th that was, Joe understood that eventually he would redeem himself. He would find meaning in his life by telling the stories of the people that he met. He was frustrated throughout his life in telling those stories for publication. He, his only audience really was his family, which is no small audience, by the way. I mean, this is really important. He he changed the lives of the people around him, his friends and family members, with the stories that he told them. Um, but at the end, you know, I, I, I really, I, it is a hopeful ending, even though we know how it's going to end, because Joe's words were preserved. Um, you know, a lot of people worked to preserve his words. His mother worked to preserve his words. His brother later would work to preserve his writing. And then Santiago, this rebel commander, excuse me, this rebel radio uh, uh, station uh, leader, he became the unofficial archivist of the revolution and he preserved Joe's diaries, smuggled them away out of El Salvador during the war to Nicaragua. And, and so a lot of people um, believed in Joe. A lot of people, you know, uh, it, it invested part of themselves in them and helped to save his words. And I think in the end, yes, it's a book. It's a book about the power of stories, the power of the written word to preserve stories, to pass on experiences, to make connections between people. And, um, and that I think is, uh, it, it leads to an ending that is really, th that is more, um, more hopeful than, than you might expect when you read the novel. I would think so too. I, it, there's an affirmation yes. to that ending, which even though you're witness to all this, I mean, let's be frank, horror, all this horror, all these, all these, these terrible, terrible uh, 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 events, still at the, at the end of it, it's almost as if there's a, I hate to, I, I hope I'm not using this incorrectly, but almost something Zen-like yes. in, in, into where Sanderson just finds a place where he just is, where he's there, where he's, he's experiencing. And he asks nothing of life beyond mm. more what it's offering him and he expects to get nothing more than what's before him. Absolutely. Um, yes, absolutely. I, I, I really, um, I enjoyed becoming him and I enjoyed telling his story um, it was, um, you know, uh, and I'm so, I'm so honored that you find that you see all of that, you know, I'm, one of my biggest worries is how will this world see Joe, right? Will they become irritated with him? Will they, will they, will they understand um, what he was trying to do in his quest and what I'm trying to do in telling the story? And so I'm so grateful you would say that. And, be yeah. Before we turn over to, to q and I will, I will just add to that this, I think maybe one's age may have something to do with how one would read the story. Um, mm. reading it as a 50 year old, you have to ask yourself some questions in terms of, have I done everything I wanted to do? <laughs> um, right. You know, Joe's, uh, path as difficult as it was and as hard as it was, does make clear that your time here is finite. Absolutely. What, what did you see? Who did you help? Right. What did you do? All of these things that, you know, hopefully as a young person, you would still 
you know, you would get a sense of, but certainly as a middle-aged person, makes you, makes you, it gives you pause. And also, right. I think allows you, a, I would hope, space for um, generosity towards Joe because no one's going to get this right. right. <laughs> Well, you know, I think uh, as uh, you know, I think because of our generation where we are right now, you're you're a parent, I'm a parent, mm -hmm. you know, um, you're just attuned to the cycles of life, and so being attuned to the cycles of life, there's a lot of that in the novel. You know, there's a moment where Joe or Joe goes off to college, and he's there at the at the you know at the at the train station in Champaign Urbana with his uh, with his mom and, and dad and his brother, and you know, I sent I sent off my kids to college. And that moment, you know, that moment was influenced by remembering me being, remembering being a college kid going off to college and also being the parent. And there's, you know, there's a lot of cycles of life, a lot of um, intergenerational stuff going on in this book. That's absolutely true. So now let's do, uh, Josiah, should we do the Q&A? Yeah. Uh, excuse me, uh, from the audience? Yeah, yeah. I feel like a, a killjoy interrupting this conversation, but we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let, let, let's get to that. Um, Marissa was wondering, um, Hector, uh, can you describe your experience working with your editor in shaping this book? Yeah. How much work did you make Sean McDonald do? <laughs> you know, uh, um, what I, I, I made Sean McDonald do a lot of work, but then he made me do the work that he thought the novel <laughs> needed to be you know, Like a good editor. Yeah, so I originally turned, my original manuscript that I wrote, which I didn't show to Sean, was probably in the neighbor of 180,000 words. And then when I sent to my agent, and then my agent sent to my editor, to Sean McDonald, FSG, uh, MCD, was um, maybe about 160,000 words. And so Sean, you know, basically told me what he thought, um, you know, uh, I could cut. Um, so, you know, I had, to, I had to eliminate a lot of girlfriends. And so that's why Joe comments on the footnotes, hey, this guy, <laughs> he's, he's, he's cheating me out of all these girlfriends I had in real life, right? Because there were just too many. Uh, he was a real charmer and there were just too many. Um, and also, you know, you know it, it, was, it was difficult after a while for me to, to sort of differentiate them. And I think that that reflects more on me than it does on Joe. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, there was, there was that. And also, I think that, uh, you know, Sean... Uh, also made me see that maybe I was being a little bit too uh, rose-colored glasses when I described Joe's childhood, and and sort of um, that you know he he so I added a lot of edge to those to that first section of the book, um, you know at uh, when Sean uh, gave me that feedback, um, and so yeah I, it was it's all I love I love just the editing process, and and Sean uh, helped helped me bring this in at a reasonable length and, and focused, much more focused um, th than it was, yeah. And then uh, Hector, you, you touched on this very briefly, but um, Catherine was wondering uh, where are Joe's papers, his manuscripts, his mm. typescripts, and are they being housed for permanent access? And might they be digitalized at some point? Well, right now they are in the possession of um, Steve Sanderson and Jenny Bloom. <laughs> Uh, who are on this call, and the, and and Steve is very meticulous. He has it in a air conditioned, uh, you know, temperature controlled room, <laughs> and that's because he lives in in Florida. Uh, and so it's in they're in Florida in in Steve's, in Steve and Jenny's home. And it was always my dream that uh, that I would write a novel that was that was so good and uh, <laughs> had such impact in America <laughs> that there would be this clamor of, you know, like save Joe's papers and, you know, and that the University of Illinois or some institution would, would take them. Because I really do think that they are Joe's crowning achievement as a writer are his letters home. <laughs> the diary is actually in the, the diary, Joe's diary that he kept that was on his backpack when he died is in a museum already. It's in the archive of the Museum of the Revolution. It's called the Museo de la Imagen y la Palabra um, in San Salvador. And they also have, uh, they, have they actually have state of the art, you know, archive, um, uh, you know, preservation there. So they've preserved Joe's uh, diary, some other stuff that he's written. And uh, Steve also has his novels and has preserved them. So, um, but I think, you know, in the long term, it would be wonderful if, if some institution would express interest or if we could convince some institution, um, you know, to, to take those letters because I think they really are a wonderful artifact of American history, 
um, a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, product of, of American life, American culture. Well, let me, let me ask you this, Hector, let me follow up on that. Is it impossible to wander the world the way Joe did anymore? I, I say this because- yeah, Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. It isn't, you know, and that, that's part of why it's, it's the last great road bump. That's why yeah. I called it the last great road bump, because, you know, Joe wandered, um, Joe wandered across Afghanistan and he hitchhiked from, he hitchhiked from, uh, from Nepal to Iraq and to Syria, you know, and so he did all these things that are now no longer possible. Um, yeah. And, and not only that, the world has changed. People are more skeptical of, 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 of Americans, which Joe saw in his lifetime. He saw that. And so um, that's part of what I really enjoyed about writing the novel was that I was writing about a world that has passed, right? Um, a time that has passed. Um, you know, a lot of it too reminded me of that film, Catch Me If You Can, you know, where Leonardo DiCaprio is playing this uh, con man who's circling, the, you know, circling around the United States um, because that's how innocent the world was. The world was open to, to young, handsome adventurers and now people around in the world are more skeptical too <laughs> about Americans. And so, so Joe wouldn't have, he, I, I think it would be very, very difficult to lead the kind of life that he led. Also, I think with that sort of modesty, you know, what, is, what, I mean by, what I mean by that is this, um, what would the temptation now be for a, you know, a putative Joe Sanderson to Instagram every single moment oh, right. of his exactly. life on the road? Um, you know, where would be the spontaneity in terms of hospitality, when you can Airbnb uh, a stay anywhere across the world as long as you have a smartphone. Um, you know, this is, this is, I mean, it just may be in terms of the ubiquity of technology on that level too, just impossible. Yeah, and, and, and also when you write, when you sit down to write a letter, which is what Joe did everywhere he went, you know, you sit down and you, you think about the day and you, okay. it's a slower process. Uh, I mean, even writing a letter in a computer where you're going to write a few hundred words as opposed to, you know, well, I'm doing a post, um, you know, it's a slower process. So writing a letter and then, you know, stamping the letter and then putting it in the mailbox. And, uh, you know, and the, at one point, one of the things that I cut in between drafts was just following one of Joe's letters from, uh, in this case, from British Guyana to, de to delivery in Champaign-Urbana. Um, but, you know, I had to cut so many things. I cut that because it was just too much. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that process is one that allows contemplation and reflection, right? We're going to reflect on, uh, on, on what we've lived um, through this process of, of letter writing that involves, you know, pen and paper. And the tangibility, you think of that, the actual material in your hand that you knew came from this person that you loved. Right. And that, that there, it's there. It is a, it's a physical thing. It's there with the stamps. It's there knowing, you know, he licked that envelope. You know that he held the envelope. You know that that's his handwriting. That's, right. uh, to me, Absolutely. that's that's incredible. Absolutely. Uh, Neil Neil was wondering, uh, Hector, since the book is so rooted in fact, how did you feel when writing the more fictionalized elements of the story? Yeah, you know, it became kind of a habit where um, there were some things that were very very factual, very rooted. And that was kind of a, you know, th those were, those have their own sort of logic of writing. But then you have these empty spaces um, that you have to fill, you know, Joe with his first girlfriend, um, uh, you know, um, the, the, I wanted to write something from the point of view of the Rwandan school children who Joe lectured because Joe <laughs> pretends to be uh, a wandering <laughs> professor as he goes through, um, you know, uh, Africa, East Africa. And he, in Kigali, Rwanda, he pretends to be a professor. So I wanted to imagine, for example, him being the professor. I mean, excuse me, I wanted to imagine the, the kids who are listening to him and also say something, a little sort of subtle thing there about Rwandan history uh, and what's going to happen later in Rwanda, um, if you know Rwandan history. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are so fun. It just became, I mean, I, I just really loved writing these fictionalized passages. Um, I just loved the joy, the freedom of them, right? That was to me, uh, you know, um, one of the things that really made me enjoy writing as a novel. You know, imagining myself to be the Salvadoran kid who meets Joe uh, when Joe is, is in a safe house in El Salvador and being that young Salvadoran kid who later is going to grow up to be an immigrant to the United States who's going to have kids. 
that to me was very, um, it just made the world of the, of the book grow so much bigger than it already was. The emotional world of the book grow bigger. And um, so I, I took great pleasure in writing those. But the facts were also this wonderful kind of like clock that was moving forward. It was like, it was like a road that I could follow. And that's really liberating too as a writer. When you have a structure, you can follow. You know, I'm going to go from here to point A to point B, and then it's going to end on this day. And then, you know, there's going to be a code after that and all that, you know. And so, so the facts themselves also can be kind of like, they become like the bicycle that you're riding. And so the facts um, of, of, of his life uh, were also something that, I, that really were kind of a comfort for me when I was writing the story. So it, for me, the hard part is now going back to write other books that are nonfiction and pure nonfiction and then a novel that I'm writing and not one based on fact. And I have to sort of relearn how to think about the writing process. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Hey, uh, I actually, I have a question, Hector. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, I'd like to bring in, uh, I'd like to actually bring in Joe's brother if I could, because like you mentioned, they're in the audience. And uh, uh, Steve actually, Joe's brother made a very sweet comment. He says, uh, we feel so blessed that Hector wrote Joe's story. He has become part of our family and we are forever grateful for the time, effort, and talent he poured into this novel. That's a, uh, Steve, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, but <laughs> can we get some insight as to how the uh, whole uh, process worked with, with Hector and, and him checking out your familia's history and all that? Can we talk a little bit about that? Oh. Oh. He's oh. muted. You're He's muted, muted, Steve. Let's see here. He doesn't see if have... we can mute Steve. He needs to activate his um, audio. Yeah, he needs to activate his audio on Zoom. So Steve, if you can just, unmuted. on the bottom left, there's a mute button you can uh, un He's un done that. that. Yeah, there's no mute symbol on him, so. Yeah, yeah. Can, can you hear me? Forward? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hey. All right, forward. Um, Hector contacted me by email shortly after we had moved to South Carolina and he said I found your brother's diaries and I was skeptical and so we exchanged a few skeptical emails and he finally convinced me that it was real and uh, eventually came to visit us in our home in South Carolina and has visited us here in Florida and I've given him full access to all the material that I have on Joe, which is volumes and volumes of stuff. And Hector literally became a member of our family. Okay. And I was very pleased in the book when he said he became Joe. So it has been a totally delightful process. Wow. Wow. I was That's hoping wonderful. for for some dirt, but I, that just uh, <laughs> no, no dirt. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. That's, that's such a beautiful thing. And then you know, Hector too. I mean, I, I don't want to take it too much time or anything, but this is such an amazing. You know, for me, for a Latino, growing up in the '80s, you know, mm. the whole Central American, we were erased from that. We were just we we're distance from it you know with Reagan and everything else and growing up so hearing you tell this story through through Joe's perspective of all things it's, it's a real it's a real gift it really is you know and, and hearing this story and El Mosoto and La Matanza and you know being schooled on all of that from this really unique perspective it, 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 it's it's a lot it's a real real it's a beautiful thing really well, well thank you for saying that thank you for saying that it was really you know I think that when you write a book um, I think when I was younger, I thought about the final product and I thought about the final product as this, you know, thing that would exist in the world and go out into the world and sort of represent me. But now when I look at a book, I look at the final product, like the one I have right behind me, which also I should say you can buy if you go down to, the, <laughs> uh, you know, if you go down to the chat function, you'll see a link to where you can buy this book from the Legendary City Lights and they really really could use your help. So even if you already have a book, buy one for a friend there. Mm -hmm. um, but now when I look at a book, I look at, um, I look at, I think of the experiences I had, you know, uh, writing it. I think about the people that I met. Um, I think about meeting Steve and Jenny. And I think about the long hours that I spent um, in, in Steve's offices. You know, Steve ha had different offices where 
uh, you know, in, in time I've known him, he's moved a couple of times where um, he stored all this stuff and he would just very kindly, um, you know, lay out the stuff for me. Here it is, Hector, you know, give me access to a fax machine, excuse me, to a scanner. Give me, let me take pictures of everything, you know, answer my questions afterward, you know, and then we would drink wine. He would, he and Jenny would serve me a glass of wine, all very civilized, you know, and, uh, and I would, uh, so I think about that in this, in writing this book. Um, and I think about too, about the writer I was trying to make myself into, you know, I was trying to, uh, and as you said so sweetly, Oscar, about how this is, you know, a book that fits in so well with my career. I was trying to think of all the things I've done in my career as a writer and all the people who've helped me in my career, you know, the editors and um, the agents, uh, the readers, uh, and I say readers because when you meet someone who's read one of your books and been moved by one of your books, as, as, as you have, Oscar, it just really keeps you going. And it just makes the process, um, it makes the process one that's bearable because writing is such a solitary process. I would meet with Steve and Jenny and we would spend, you know, two or three days together. And then I would go back home and take all my material and dive back into the book and and, and it's a very, very solitary process for many, many years. You, you seek out solitude, you know, two or three hours a day, six days a week for seven years. <laughs> that's, you know, that's, uh, it's a lot of solitude. And, um, and so when I look at that book, I think about that. And I think also about uh, all the people who made it possible for me to be a writer, a Latino writer, you know, uh, all the people who've opened up the, those paths for me and my trying to open up the paths even wider. You know, part of the, my mission with this book is to show, uh, you know, a, a generation Latino writers that you can write about anything. You know, this is, this is a topic seemingly far afield from my own personal experience in terms of the first half of the book. But I, you know, I gave it the college try. You know, I really dived my, dove into it. And I want, uh, I, I want to give one more example to um, this, you know, generation of Latino writers coming up as to what's possible for them to do in fiction, you know. And so, um, and I think we're all doing that as writers, all of us Latino writers, uh, all of us Latinx writers. So, so thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. Of course, of course. Well, Oscar, do you have any uh, la last questions or any parting comments before we go our, our, our ways? Uh, just to say, just to say to Hector, congratulations on the book. It's fantastic. And uh, to thank everybody for tuning in uh, and, uh, and, and for, for this conversation and and, you know, and again, uh, support City Lights. Support City Lights, please. Support your independent bookstore. Um, City Lights is an incredible institution that has really endured uh, some tough times recently. So if you can uh, support them by buying my book or any other book that they have there, it's a wonderful institution. Please do so. And, um, and you'll, help, you'll help keep literary culture alive. You know, we're living in times that are very challenging for all of us in different ways. So please help support uh, literary culture, independent bookstore culture, and, um, and thank you very much. Yeah, I'll give it up, please, y'all, for our very special guest tonight, Hector Tovar and Oscar yes. Villalon in conversation together. Give thank them those you. jazz hands, that, that love, <laughs> those emojis, all that good stuff. And what a wonderful way to spend the evening. Thank you so much to the two of you, seriously. Um, and to our audience as well for being here. Um, to learn more about City Lights and its upcoming events, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And also, I want to just really quickly tell you about a couple of amazing events coming up. Um, Hector was, of course, schooling us on Central American Historia, and also coming up on Tuesday, September 11th, uh, September 8th, I should say, Tuesday, September 8th, City Lights is going to be hosting Roberto Lovato. Mm. We're going to be joining uh, him with Miriam Gerba. They're going to be discussing his new memoir and book, Unforgetting. So we got a whole Central American theme going on here, which I love very much. Also, Barry Gifford, the great Barry Gifford, is going to be in conversation with Rob Christopher on September 23rd. So you want to tune into that. And if uh, any of you all missed some of this event, it's going to be rebroadcast on YouTube. If you know anyone who hasn't watched this or wants to hear about it, Tell them to go to YouTube or visit the City Lights live page. Uh, I've been Josiah Luis Alderete, broadcasting from the great Lawrence Ferlinghetti's office above City Lights. <laughs> and I want to say, y'all, blessings to all of you. I hope to see y'all in real time real soon. And just like it says on the uh, walls around here, remember, Printer's Inc. is the greatest explosive. <laughs>
Take care, y'all. Buenas right. noches. Buenas noches. Good night. Thanks, Oscar. Oh, no.